And Mara, you're going to share your screen. Um, you need to enable. Okay, try again. Greetings and thank you for joining us today for the first webinar of our year long COVID Commons webinar series. My name is Nate Wade, and I will be the moderator for today's event. As co-PIs for the COVID Commons Initiative, Mara and I would like to first acknowledge and thank the Rockefeller Foundation for their support. Before introducing our panelists, there are a few housekeeping items to cover. First, this session is being recorded and it will be posted in the near future on our website, asucovidcommons.com. Next, we will have a Q&A session during the last 15 minutes of this webinar. Please submit your questions using the Q&A feature and not the chat feature. Once again, please use the, use the Q&A feature for the questions. We value your feedback and plan to send a brief survey asking for your input about today's webinar and ideas for future events. Finally, we want to encourage you to go, get involved in our COVID Commons community of practice. Once the webinar concludes, please visit asucovidcommons.com and sign up to get invitations to future webinars, receive our upcoming testing technology trends newsletter for keeping workers well. Now that housekeeping is behind us, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists for today, Mara Aspinall and Dr. Mark McClellan. Mara Aspinall has been an amazing partner to work with over the past four months. She's a professor, she is a professor of practice and co-founder of the Biomedical Diagnostics Program within the College of Health Solutions at Arizona State University. Mara is a managing director and co-founder of Bluestone Venture Partners and managing director of Health Catalysts Group. She's also served on the Health and Human Services Secretary's Advisory Council on Genetics, Health, and Society in both the Obama and Bush administrations. Mark McClellan is a physician and an economist. He is the Robert J. Margolis Professor of Business, Medicine, and Policy and founding director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University. With a highly distinguished record in public service and academic research, Dr. McClellan is a former administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and former commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration where he developed and implemented major reforms in health policy. Thank you both so much for giving your time today and sharing how we can take back control during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Nate. Um, good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us. And it's a pleasure to be here with Mark to talk about taking back control in the broadest way but our timing is perfect because many of you may have seen that just yesterday, the Duke Margolis Center with the support from the Rockefeller Foundation just issued a new report on a national decision point on testing, tracing, and how we can best deal with this crisis moving forward. And Mark will talk about that report. But to give you a little bit more context of what we're going to do this morning, as Nate said, I'm going to talk about the situation overview and some of the considerations around testing. Mark will then talk about this great report, the National Decision Point, and we'll then discuss one of the key pieces of the report, testing protocol. We will then move on to a short summary of diagnostic commons, how you can take a look of the research that ASU has put together and then we will end with a question and answer session. So with that, let me set the stage. And I like to think about this in four different pieces, what we call situation, complication, question, and answer. 
So where are we in this situation? We don't need to go through the numbers to talk about almost 200,000 Americans dying and millions in the US and across the world being infected by COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. But the core of the situation today is that there has not been enough testing to control the virus. Um, why is that important? It's because somewhat uniquely, 40% of infected patients are indeed completely asymptomatic. So when we talk about testing, it's not testing just to count the numbers of people. It is testing to control and reduce transmission and take that number that you've heard, the r naught down to below one and ultimately zero. However, um, there are significant complications. Number one, for most of the last several months, there have been not enough tests available. Number two, when the tests were available, there are not enough protocols to guide decision makers and average Americans to see what kind of tests they should be using and how they should be using that. This is most acute in these high risk settings like nursing home, long term care, and clearly schools, K through 12, and universities. And lastly, probably the area that there's been the least press about to date is the best way to use these tests. I spent a lot of my career in personalized medicine, and this is no different. The same test will not work as effectively for every person in every different setting, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So the question that we see and we will continue to focus on is how do we take back control from the virus? The answer to a large part is the report, a national decision point. And we'll go through that in some detail and be open to your questions. So before we go into the report, I'd like to give you the context of what I call the understanding testing use cases. This is at a relatively high level, but critical to lay the foundation to move forward with the protocol. First, let me describe the three different testing types. Number one, diagnostic testing. That is most typically and has the vast majority of tests in what's called PCR tests. The vast majority of these happen in a central laboratory, an academic laboratory, a public health laboratory. So samples are taken from the person and then sent into a lab and answers sent back. Secondly, screening testing. This is when we screen a large number of people um, they get the results back, but it's all about screening people without symptoms or asymptomatic. The objective here is to isolate the contagious. We see this as an opportunity to truly control the transmission of the virus. When you look at the characteristics you can see here at the top, the diagnostic testing should be at least 95% sensitive and 99% specific. Screening can be lower, 70%, but virtually all the tests that are out there now are above 85% sensitive and at least 90% specific. When we talk about these, the best way to describe it is for something that is 95% sensitive, that means there are a potential of 5% false negative. I remember that as N in sensitive and N in negative. 99% specific only 1% false positive, and Mark will talk more about that. Lastly, the third type of test is surveillance testing. This is the testing that you may have seen and heard about, something like wastewater testing. It's not about testing individuals, it's about testing a community, and if you get a positive signal, then moving to testing individuals. So this is the foundation to remember, diagnostic screening and surveillance, different uses for different people at different settings. So what's out there today? Well, if you look at testingcommons.com, and we'll show it later, but you will see more than 1,600 tests across the world. And these tests are a wide variety of technologies. Uh, on the left-hand side of the chart, you will see the major technologies that exist today. On the right hand, you'll see the number of EUAs, emergency use authorizations. And of the FDA's roughly 235 EUAs, 
there are 175 of them that are PCR in a central lab. But that doesn't tell the whole story. If you look at different technologies, first we list the central lab technologies. Again, they're not just all PCR. Many of these are what's called molecular technology, and they range the gamut. What is most common about these tests is they are exquisitely sensitive and specific. 95, 97%, 95% and a minimum, but really closer to 100%. The relative price is across the spectrum as well. But then we see a new type of test that has become much more common in the last few weeks, which are point of care tests. And these tests are also molecular, like a lamp test. But the ones that have gotten most of the press and we believe have the biggest potential impact are these antigen tests. And as opposed to looking at the virus itself and the genetic material, the antigen tests look for the protein on the surface of the cell. And these are typically much faster, 15 to 30 minutes. Their sensitivity is somewhat lower. This is the range of all of them, but three out of four of these tests are closer to 96, 97% sensitive and um, very highly specific. There are other tests, one of which is here, which is a point of care PCR test. And then maybe most exciting for the future, we believe that there will be fully home tests, not just collecting your sample at home and sending it in, but a self-test that can be done similar to a pregnancy test. This is an example of a test where you might have this as a nasal swab, swab it yourself at home, put it in reagent, and get an answer with the lines on the test. So we do believe that these types of tests and others will exist in the future. As I mentioned, antigen tests have been the most prevalent, well, prevalent is a bad word here, but the, the most discussed uh, recently. So just a quick primer on this, and I'll hand it over to Mark. As I mentioned, antigen tests look for specific proteins on the surface of the virus. The PCR tests are the ones looking for the virus genetic material, genetic RNA. The antigen test specifications vary, but overall, um, they are much higher than they were as little as six weeks ago. I think what's most important and a core belief as we go into the discussion of the report is while these tests and no test is perfect, they have the ability to find the most contagious person. So they can find people at close to 100% sensitivity that are most likely to be spreaders of the virus. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mark, who will discuss the report, the protocols, and the implications that he and the rest of his colleagues at Duke have found at this time. Mark? Mark, thank you very much for that framing. It's a pleasure to uh, be with you and Nate for this important webinar with the COVID Commons, very timely, as you said. And also, it's been terrific uh, working with you on this report and so many other activities uh, related to containing the pandemic in the United States. And just a, a little bit more context before I dive in. Um, the report's available on uh, Duke Margolis' website, I think through uh, ASU as well, and also through uh, the Rockefeller Foundation. The reason this is important now, as you all know, is that we have not uh, been particularly effective in containing the spread of COVID in the United States uh, with a significant number of deaths. Also, while most people don't have any uh, serious uh, consequences for COVID, and as Mara said, many people uh, are asymptomatic while they're spreading, and many times throughout the whole illness, uh, many people have gone on the serious complications, including uh, not only death, but uh, hospitalizations and some long-term complications that we're only beginning to understand as well. The consequence of that is not only for our health, but for our economy and, and broader well-being with the result of the, the lack of ability to confidently contain the virus. Most schools in the United States are not open today. Many businesses are not operating at uh, uh, anywhere near full capacity and the economic consequences have been enormous. And there's been 
been some debate about having to choose between health and having to choose between versus uh, uh, expanding the economy. I think what we've found is that places around the world that have tried to reopen without containing the pandemic not only have had health consequences, but have had ec economic consequences as well. So we need a better solution. The U.S. is different. We're not going to do this the same way that China has or um, any Asian or even European countries has. That's pretty clear from the independence that we've seen across many Americans and the fact that we've got a very uh, federal uh, system of approaching these uh, national or global public health problems. But we do have some unique opportunities now, thanks to the innovations in diagnostic testing technology that Mara just re reviewed. And what this report describes is a path forward from here, how to get from talking about the number of tests we have and whether those are too many or too few to an actual national testing strategy that fits the nature of the pandemic and our capacity for response in the United States. Uh, what we do in this report is outline the challenge that we're facing today, the way that diagnostic technologies that are here and that are coming, not in some distant future, but in the next month or two, uh, the, the, the coming months, when we're still going to be dealing with the consequences of the pandemic, how those tests can potentially be used to contain outbreaks in a way that we haven't been able to achieve using the traditional public health methods of identifying cases and then isolating them and then doing contact tracing around them. We've just got uh, too much COVID in the U.S. and also uh, too much, too many challenges to implement uh, uh, contact tracing very widely and effectively with this much de degree of uh, infection. Uh, we need to do more to identify new outbreaks early as they're occurring, especially if we're trying to reopen settings like schools or keep people safe in settings like nursing homes where there is just going to be some close contact despite all of our best efforts to impose mitigation measures and encourage behavior changes to uh, reduce the spread. So that's the context for this report. And it goes on to talk about not only uh, what testing strategies can work most effectively uh, given all of this context, but also what the consequences are for our national policies. How much is it going to cost? Uh, how, what policy changes are needed to achieve it? Uh, what's the path forward from here? And that's why we view this as a national decision point right now. Before now, we didn't have the diagnostic testing technologies available. We didn't have the know-how. Now, with some additional investments and some action by businesses, by state and local governments, all supported by the federal government on a testing strategy, uh, we think we can do substantially better in containing spread, giving people confidence about sending their kids back to school uh, and uh, getting uh, back to more of the critical businesses that are so important for the future of the economy, not to mention improving health outcomes for Americans. So uh, if we go to the next slide, the, um, uh, the, the framework for the report uh, recognizes that this is not just about testing uh, and it's not just about the numbers of tests. It's about testing strategies that are appropriate for particular settings. Um, in the U.S., there's quite broad agreement among public health authorities, experts, clinicians, and others that if you have symptoms of COVID-19, you need to get tested. And we want to make those tests available quickly and easily. They're, they should be free under our current uh, uh, COVID uh, emergency laws like uh, the CARES Act. And they should be very high quality tests, those lab tests, the PCR tests that, that Mara described. Those are very sensitive, very specific tests, which is what you want to diagnose someone, oh, you can go back to the previous slide, I'm still, I'm still talking away, <laughs> um, uh, to, to uh, diagnose people accurately because people are going to make decisions based on this. You know, they've got symptoms, do they need to isolate for 10 days, uh, do they need to let their contacts know, et cetera, uh, and, and treatments are increasingly available too. So those tests need to be very accurate. They uh, take, as Mara said, can take a day or so uh, to get back if there's no delays. That's what we should be aiming for for people who we think there's a high chance that they really could have COVID and we want to make decisions for that individual. Also, people who are close contacts of those with uh, COVID uh, who had known close contact exposures. They have a high risk of uh, developing COVID and, and we wanna uh, protect them and the people close to them. So those very accurate lab diagnostic tests are important for those individuals as well. As Mara said, our capacity for those, doing those tests has increased, but it's not unlimited. Uh, when you see numbers reported like uh, five to six million tests per day, that's mainly the lab tests that are being 
being done. And it's uh, been a system that's been overwhelmed in the last few months, not just because of more people getting COVID and more people needing checks for symptoms um, as a result of that, but also because we're using, have been using those lab tests for this other important purpose that Mara described, screening. And this is where the new kinds of point of care tests are going to be very important going forward. Uh, screening tests are done not for people who you think are very likely to have COVID, but for people who are in a setting where if they did have it and they did spread it to others, which can happen and does happen often because of the importance of asymptomatic spread, we would have serious consequences. So if you're not if you're if you're able to work at home if you're able to socially distance if you're able to wear a mask if you're not in those settings you know you're at low risk if you're living in a place where the community rate of covid is very low there are not that many of them in the united states right now but that's what that surveillance testing that mara described can can help determine if you're in a place where there's very little covid you know there's not much benefit to screening but if you're a worker in a nursing home, if you're another essential worker, a firefighter, someone who is going to be around uh, others closely despite best efforts for, for mitigation, uh, if you're going back to school, if you're going back to university, there are real risks of transmission and there are consequences of, those, uh, of, the, of that transmission as well that may be greater or lesser depending on the context. The consequences of transmission in a nursing home uh, are catastrophic. 40% or more of the deaths that have occurred in the United States are in that setting. So very important setting to contain outbreaks early. And where screening helps is identifying the potential for an outbreak to spread, identifying when an outbreak occurs and its potential for spread quickly, enabling more effective action to isolate those who are positive but didn't have symptoms, to reduce the number of cases that occurs, to improve outcomes, to keep schools open, to avoid uh, deaths in nursing homes and the like. What we have not done in this country yet is take a systematic approach to thinking about all these important contexts where uh, we would like to do more, we'd like to reopen, we'd like to get kids back to more of a normal school experience. How can the tests that we have, along with the other mitigation measures, which are really important, distancing, redesigning uh, workspaces or, or offices or schools, uh, wearing masks, things like that. How can they all work together to reduce and eliminate the potential for significant spread? So the first thing that the report does is lay out this kind of framework for a testing strategy. Where do we want to use these new tests that are coming along uh, at potentially large scale? And that starts with a risk assessment of the setting and the population affected. How likely are people to be infected? Very important for that is what's going on in the community, not just um, uh, the people like right around where the school is, but where the school's workers come from, where the students come from if they're bussed in, uh, what happens on the buses and the, the transportation to get there. So that's all part of the assessment of the likelihood of infection along with uh, whatever mitigation measures can and should uh, be taken to reduce the likelihood of spread then what's the risk of the likelihood of onward transmission? That depends on how people, how close people are in these settings, how much they interact, uh, both if they're following the, the guidelines and if they're not getting together uh, in ways uh, uh, outside of class or, or otherwise that, that um, can uh, add to the risk of spread. And then, as I mentioned, the consequences of transmission. So that risk assessment helps a policymaker or someone owning a, a business uh, enterprise decide where are the most important setting and who are the most important populations uh, that should be part of the screening test program as part of this overall strategy on mitigating and preventing outbreaks and spread of COVID-19. That's where the testing strategy then comes in. So the kinds of tests that Mara described, particularly the point of care test, but also potentially pooled PCR tests can be used to uh, uh, regularly screen, not just one time, but on an ongoing basis, depending on the, these, all these characteristics of the population, as well as the features of the test, uh, to determine whether or not someone who doesn't have symptoms is in fact potentially uh, uh, inf infectious and, and at risk of transmitting it on to others. And then that enables actionable results. The, the third part of this slide, the, uh, which might include confirming whether this screen 
screening test that's positive is really a, a true positive test. We talked about the, uh, the false positives a few minutes ago. Uh, and then what should that individual do? Uh, should they stay home from uh, school? Should they move to an, uh, an isolation dorm? Uh, should other measures be taken for those who are in uh, close contact? Are there learnings that should lead to a response in the way the environment uh, of that workplace or school or other setting is, uh, is set up? So those are, that's the framework that, that we lay out in this paper that we're intending to apply in a wide range of settings. That's what Mara called the, the protocols. So uh, on to the next slide. Finally, uh, so the testing strategy, that's the middle part that I talked about. The tests are, are part of this, but it's part of an overall strategy. Uh, depends on three things. You know, which test you wanna use depends on uh, the characteristics of the test, how sensitive and, and specific it is, as Mara described. Uh, how often you're gonna use it. If you test more often, you got more of a chance of uh, detecting outbreaks and if you wait uh, a longer period of time. And very importantly, how much time from when you actually get that, that test sample, that nasal swab or spit or, or whatever the sample is, uh, to let you actually get the results. Uh, just because you get the test done doesn't enable action. You've gotta get the results back uh, for actionability. Uh, other things that go into decisions about testing use, the cost, uh, as up until now, we haven't had a whole lot of these tests available. We need, a, uh, as, as uh, the supply increases um, and we can make more, uh, um, uh, trans have decisions based on more transparent information about tests that are available, it'll be easier to, to implement these kinds of protocols. Uh, the type of sampling that you're doing, you know, is a, a, a nasopharyngeal swab, is it something that people can do uh, themselves, maybe at home, uh, if not completely by themselves under observation or otherwise, what staff are needed to support these efforts. It sounds like a lot and we'll get to the cost in a little while, uh, but these kinds of protocols are actually being implemented now in places like nursing homes and uh, universities like mine at Duke uh, on, on a regular basis to help with exactly the goals that we've described here. Uh, next slide. Um, so how does time matter uh, for screening? Um, one of the things that matters, we've talked about before, is sensitivity. So you ideally like to have a test that's really accurate, that, that doesn't miss any infectious cases, that doesn't uh, identify any people wrongly who uh, are not in, uh, infectious uh, as, a, as a positive, you know, doesn't have the false positive problem, and can get the results immediately. We don't have those tests, even with all the technological progress that's occurring here, um, we're working with tests that have less than perfect characteristics. In particular, tests, if they're very rapid, these antigen point of care tests are not generally as sensitive as those lab-based PCR tests, but they can be much faster. Uh, as Mara will talk about later, uh, some of the new point of care tests that are available at very large scale or will be available very soon at very large scale, you know, 50 million per month, have results available in 15 minutes. That's a big difference from a day turnaround time or if there's a lab backup three or four, and you have to mail it off and so forth, three or four or five days. This is a study done by Dan Laramore and some of his colleagues on how much of a difference sensitivity or accuracy of the test versus timing makes. And the, the bar on the left-hand chart uh, that goes up to 100%, uh, that's basically the rate of infection that you'll get in a particular setting if you do all of the other mitigation measures. Again, they're not perfect, especially with asymptomatic people in some close contact or, or, or failures to follow the, the, the recommended guidelines. That's the amount that you get with everything you can do outside of testing. So you add in a testing strategy, what happens? Well, if you pick a test that's very accurate, you're gonna pick up more infections. So uh, that's the, um, the, the magenta bar here. That's a LOD, it's a lower level of detection. Um, and uh, sorry, the lighter one bar. And then um, for a less sensitive test, the darker purple, um, that's a, a, a test that doesn't detect quite as many viruses. And what you can see is if you test in this particular kind of setting only every two weeks, um, you're not gonna get much benefit. Uh, that's because, and uh, given the, the rate of spread of, uh, of this virus, two weeks is an eternity. Um, uh, and so you need to be testing more frequently if you really wanna bring down the, the, the rate of infection. 
What if you go to a week? Well, you can see that the more sensitive test makes a difference if you're just testing once a week. Uh, and that means the time from, you know, when you, uh, th that means the uh, uh, timing between tests is, is just is, is one week. So everybody's getting tested on a repeat basis. And you can see you can get about 40% um, versus, sorry, 60% reduction versus 80% reduction, significantly more reduction if you're testing weekly with a more sensitive test. But then look what happens when you test more often. Um, there's almost no difference. Both of these approaches can drive the rate of transmission almost down to zero. Why does sensitivity matter less if you're testing more often? Well, as long as you can get the results back quickly, that enables you to take action after you get a positive test, if you miss a case the first time, uh, if the infection, um, if the level of the virus is, is, is uh, at, not at a level that a less sensitive test could address, it's not that bad because you're going to test again a few days later. You're gonna, there, there are less consequences of missing a positive case with fr more frequent testing. And on the right, it goes on to emphasize the importance of reporting delays. Uh, basically, uh, reporting delays on the, the horizontal axis, longer delays in reporting are very damaging uh, to control efforts. That's why when we had the big delays in lab reported tests in the summer of a week, um, got to the point where that testing was even useful uh, in terms of containing spread. But if you can get the delays in reporting, the between the time you're, you know, when you're, if you're testing only every, uh, uh, if you're testing every three days and you're getting the results back quickly, uh, even with a not very sensitive test, you can still get a reduction in infection rates of, uh, of 80% or more. If you go to more frequent testing, you can get that down even further. So hopefully that um, provides some insights about how different testing strategies might work and why it might make sense especially if you can't get uh, perfect, uh, very accurate tests that are affordable, why it might make sense to go to a testing strategy that involves antigen tests every several days. So based on this work, we collaborated, and going to the next slide, we collaborated with, uh, uh, with Dan Laramore and his colleagues to run a range of different models for how different strat testing strategies might work to reduce the rate of spread. And depending on how you wanna trade off these issues by testing every week, uh, testing every one to three days or testing daily, this uh, describes some of the different alternatives and more of the details are in the paper on this, uh, you can get to 70, 80% reductions, 90% reductions or more in transmission rates uh, based on some combination of less sensitive tests and more frequent and testing with rapid results. And again, there are a range of tests that can help to get you to different points on this graph. There are gonna be even more uh, coming in, in, the, in the weeks ahead. So uh, next slide. Um, we want to remind you that this is a, a, a situation where context matters. You know, you can reduce infection rates by 100% in an area where there's almost no COVID and have virtually no impact on actual infections in the population. On the other hand, if you're doing testing in an area where there is a lot of COVID present, reducing infection even by 50, 60% can make a huge difference. In the United States today, communities differ a lot in terms of how present COVID is. And we emphasize that here again, it's not even the, the, just the presence of uh, or the rate of uh, infection in an overall community, it's the rate of infection in the population where you're doing the screening testing. Um, so very low rates of um, infection in places like uh, um, kind of upstate New York, uh, the green zone. Uh, um, you're, if you do a testing strategy, you may pick up or you will pick up that one in a thousand uh, uh, positive case. But because the tests aren't perfect, because there are false positives, you're also going to pick up false positives. And this is where sensitivity of the test matters. If you want to reduce the rate of false positives so that when you get an actual test result that is positive, you're more confident that it's a, uh, it's a, a real case, um, you need a higher sensitivity test. But the tests, again, aren't perfect. And what this part of our analysis shows is you know, what you can expect based on sensitivity and based on roughly how prevalent uh, COVID is in the community that you're testing as to how likely any positive result you get 
really is a true COVID-19 infectious case. And what you can see is that if, um, if you're in an area where there's very low rates of COVID, you're gonna to tend to get more false positives, not surprising. If you're in an area where there's much higher rate, especially if you have a high sensitivity test, you're gonna get very high true positive shares of the positive test results that you get. And I add to this, that remember this is an example talking about testing a thousand people. And uh, what I think is important to remember is that you can use this as a screening strategy. It doesn't have to be a final decision strategy. Remember when uh, um, Governor DeWine in Ohio tested positive on one of these fast screening tests. Uh, they isolated him for a little bit, long enough to do a couple of those uh, lab PCR tests. They wanted to be really sure that turned out negative. So that's an example of a false positive. And having a follow-up strategy of doing lab tests on those individuals who are presumptive positive but not yet proven can be a way to make sure that you're not doing undue long isolation for uh, the false positive cases that you get from a screening test strategy. And again, what this framework can tell you is about how many of those false positive cases should you expect, depends on the characteristics of your setting as we've shown. Um, and how you can factor that into your plan as well. And just say that doing, if you're thinking about testing capacity, doing follow-up lab tests on, um, you know, take the most prevalent area, which is where you can get the most positive tests. Polk County, Georgia was our example. Um, that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 40, 50, 60 uh, tests out of a thousand people. So that's only a small fraction of them that actually need to go on to those uh, more uh, very accurate uh, lab tests where you want to try to get the results back in a day or so. But in the meantime, uh, uh, by taking action in these cases, these uh, 40, 50, 60 cases, uh, you've made it possible to really reduce the rate of spread, getting that to that 80, 90% reduction in spread, if not more, uh, that we talked about in some of the previous uh, uh, slides. So uh, next slide. Um, so uh, here are some different scenarios where we talk about them in more detail in the report of what kind of strategies might make the most sense depending on how prevalent COVID is. So if there's a, if you're in a green area with very low rates of COVID infection, basically you don't need to bother very much. You need to, to do that surveillance testing in your community to make sure that you're not seeing uh, increases in, in cases in the community and therefore an increased risk of spread uh, in your setting. Uh, but uh, distancing measures, mitigation measures that don't involve testing, are, are going to be fine in terms of um, um, you, you don't have much risk of, uh, of COVID outbreaks. As the rate of COVID in the community goes up and the chance for infection goes up, more testing is helpful. And so um, uh, in these settings are where we'd expect to see most of the tests being done, the, the yellow onto orange, uh, getting to uh, staff testing twice per week, uh, student testing on a regular basis. Now, at some point when the level of COVID spread in your community gets so high that the costs of uh, doing testing plus with lots and lots of positives, uh, plus the, the consequences of uh, spread even with an 80 or 90% reduction are still big. So there's gonna be some level at which schools may need to stay closed or at least open on a very much more limited basis. But what I hope you can see is that this is a way to enable more confident reopening and containment, even if we have a significant amount of COVID present in our communities, as we do across most of the United States today. And on to the next slide. Um, uh, this is uh, a little bit more discussion about the, the false positive results. You know, as you do more uh, screening tests, especially in low prevalence areas, you're going to see a larger share of false positives. I kind of covered this in that uh, previous slide, but again, we got more details on uh, on this in the paper and. Uh, also describing what to do uh, to, if you're concerned about a significant number of false positives in terms of confirmatory testing with, uh, with PCR uh, or, uh, or serial testing. And then uh, next slide, um, uh, here are some of these actions based on uh, uh, responding to a, pr uh, a presumptive positive test. I think I've already uh, uh, covered this. Um, if uh, you don't want to do the follow-up testing, there, you do need to have a protocol in place for isolation, quarantine, and the like. And next slide. And then I think we're, we're almost done. So as I mentioned, we got a lot of COVID in the United States right now. Scenario A is pretty much where we are, at least as of uh, last week, uh, early September. And that means if you're trying to reopen schools, 
and trying to protect people in nursing homes and aiming for those 80, 90% reductions in infection transmission. You know, the goal here, as Mara said, is to get the, uh, the R naught below one and, and really stamp these out, you know, identify the outbreaks early, prevent them from spreading, and hopefully over time, getting the infection rate down, not just in that uh, that uh, population setting within a community, but in the setting in, in the community overall. But it's gonna take a lot of testing. Um, you know, Rockefeller Foundation initially had an estimate of 100 million tests per month needed. Um, we think given the continued spread and presence of, uh, uh, of COVID in many communities, if we wanna reopen schools, if we wanna protect nursing homes and other uh, elders and congregate settings, other high risk settings with uh, essential workers, communities that have been very hard hit, the numbers today are significantly higher than that. 200 million tests a month may sound like a lot, but the cost has come down significantly, as Mara's gonna talk about in just a minute. Um, we estimate that on top of what we're already spending on testing, which is significant, uh, maybe another two, three billion dollars or so per month, if we can be clear that we're committed to this as a country, that means federal support, um, the federal government's been buying up some of the new tests that are coming out, but they haven't been very clear about that being a long-term strategy and what they're really aiming for. If they were more clear about aiming for this and saying, you know, we're gonna buy enough tests to support uh, state and local governments and vulnerable populations and getting the testing they need for effective containment, that would help propel even more manufacturing capacity in the months ahead. I know people are hoping that, you know, we're gonna get out of this and, uh, and I know I am uh, in the next few months. Uh, what vaccines are coming and uh, we've got better treatments available. Uh, I think the thing is that vaccines are, are likely to have an impact, but it's probably gonna be gradual. Starting with higher risk individuals, it's gonna take time uh, to get people vaccinated. It's gonna take time to get people even accept that uh, the vaccines are safe and effective. And even with vaccines, they're not going to be perfect. They're still going to be uh, it's sort of like flu season. There's still going to be a significant risk of spread. And I think well into 2021, as a result, months into 2021, there may not be quite as much of a demand for testing, but there still will be a significant need for it if we want to do things like keep schools open confidently and uh, let people who are in nursing homes have visitors for a change and do other things that are uh, that are really important for, for our well-being in the presence of the pandemic. So several billion dollars per month, but a lot to get for it. And that's made possible now because we do have more testing capacity available. We just need to make the most of it. And Mara, I'll turn it back to you to talk about that. Thank you, Mark. That was fantastic and uh, a tremendous amount of information in a short period of time. So let me take it from there. And as Mark mentioned, when you look at these numbers and you focus on 193 million tests a month, that is for schools and nursing homes, long-term care. It is not the broad population. So while that sounds great, the key is, do we have enough tests to make this strategy realistic? So what we did with the Duke Group and um, the Rockefeller Foundation is we've put together our estimate of capacity. And um, there are a lot of numbers here, so let me focus on the most important takeaways. Number one, 36 million tests available today. That is a key number, that is September 2020. And um, that is the baseline. If you go only one month from now, we are very optimistic that there will be 70 million tests available. And the reason that we have all these little doohickeys here is there are two very large um, new potential tests. Mark mentioned some of these new tests, Roche potential submission during Q4, 40 million tests. Lumen Ultra, 16 million tests. So we believe 70 million is the floor and that it will increase from there. If you look at, again, this select group of manufacturers, and I'll talk about the context there in a minute, if you go into January, and Mark talked about the fact, and I wholeheartedly agree, this is gonna be with us for a while, that we would then move to close to 200 million tests in Q1 and 230 million tests in April of 2021. Um, those are big numbers. Are they enough? Probably not. But if the country continues the way it is today, as Mark talked about, which is scenario A. Hopefully, however, with the big influx of tests during this year, during 2020, we will 
begin to see a reduction of transmission. So as we go forward, we will continue to keep this chart up to date. We will continue to monitor through testingcommons.com and other information where these tests are. I do want to mention, however, that these are select point of care tests. So number one, it doesn't include PCR tests, which are also increasing. Number two is not every manufacturer is here. So these are the largest ones today, but we expect that we will see others come into the market in the future. There's also the wild card here that we talked about, the stealth test. These are relatively small numbers, but we believe that there are at least two dozen other companies that are working on home tests or DIY tests or self tests, whatever you want to call them, the tests that are fully integrated. You give the sample, you get an answer yourself. So in the most classic way, I would say watch this space, and we believe there will be many more opportunities so people who want to be tested, who need to be tested, can be tested. So in that context, we wanted to share a little bit before we go to questions about what ASU and Duke are doing. And I'm also going to give you about three minutes now to start putting your questions in the question and answer link so Mark and I can answer the questions. So at the highest level, very briefly, Mark talked about the testing protocols and test use cases and the recent report. From ASU's perspective, I'm going to give you some samples of what the two of these look like. And lastly, starting next week, all of you will be on the first distribution. We will have a monthly newsletter about the newest in testing trends. So first, let's look at testing.com. I won't do this in a live function, but you'll get a sense of it. This is, as I mentioned, as of this morning, 1,621 tests. You can go into this platform and pull down any of these menus and find out the information that you want to do. We did not customize it. You get to customize it yourself. What, and this includes, by the way, as of this afternoon, specificity and sensitivity. So you can look at each test to understand initially with the EUA approved test. So let's give you a sense of what a dashboard looks like. If you're looking at regulatory status, you can look at those with CEIVDs, that's mostly in Europe, EUAs through the FDA website. You can also look at the test where FDA has revoked their permission to be marketed in the US. You can look at different specimens collected, detection technology, platforms, analysis location. You can look at country of origin, uh, there are nine different parameters that you can look for. And when you go through the parameters, you get the list of company and tests that are relevant to your parameters. And if you want to just look at finger stick self tests, you'll click on this and you'll get information just on that subset. So I encourage you to go to testingcommons.com and have some fun with this. Secondly, um, we created a system called Workplace Commons. And many of you from businesses know that one of the biggest challenges that we've talked about, in addition, what Mark talked about in terms of testing broadly, is that if you run a business today, there have been essentially zero benchmarking studies that show how companies are reacting to testing. So what this shows, and we're gonna send these out to you, so I'm not gonna go through these in detail, but you can find out who is putting out, uh, how many companies are putting out hand sanitizer masks, what safety measures are most common. Um, are my employees working face to face with others? I think you'll find out today, interesting so far, only 55% of companies are now allowing visitors. Those who do, the vast majority are having the mask. But we can also get into much more detail for those companies that are testing for viral active virus, you'll see about 21% of them are testing. And of those, 75% are testing asymptomatic. You can also find out who is being tested, where they're being tested. And very interesting, surprising to me, that 95% of the companies have some consequence if testing is mandatory and you refuse to do it. We can also look at cost. 
And lastly, who administers those tests and who's paying for those tests. So when you go into Workplace Commons, you can find out this data. But most importantly, I ask you, um, work with us, work with the brilliant people at Decision Theater, fill out the survey for your company. It could be a nail salon um, with 10 employees or a multinational with 10,000 employees. Fill out the survey so we get better data and you can learn more from it. So I'll conclude the presentation here. Mark and I will come on and answer your questions and we'll hand it over to you, Nate. Great, thank you so much. Um, the first question is for Mark, and this is a combination of two questions. What are the barriers to implementing the protocols you discussed? And the second question is about a national strategy versus, versus an individualized strategy by county, city, state. Um, and the question, some, to summarize the question is, will this report be submitted to top health officials and, and what's the goal um, for the report? Well, that is the goal. Let me start with the second question first. So we've already shared this with uh, leaders in the administration and Congress and um, have a, a briefing uh, actually this afternoon with the National Governors Association. There are a lot of governors who are uh, very interested in these issues and cities uh, all and school districts uh, all over the country. The Rockefeller Foundation has organized a supporting uh, network, uh, sort of a testing strategies group and pilot sites uh, to help turn this framework into actual action. So we're going to learn more as we go forward about how these tests actually perform in practice, not just our estimates or guesses, but how they actually do. And we're going to learn how to refine uh, these strategies as a result. Um, and uh, I was pleased to see uh, Admiral Brett Drouin, who's leading sort of the federal effort, the federal testing czar, retweeted uh, about uh, uh, our um, uh, report release yesterday. So it's definitely getting noticed. Uh, we do have some more work to do uh, in order to get um, uh, action uh, on uh, on this. So when you mentioned the first question was really about obstacles. Uh, I think there's a lot of interest, but just like everything else that's new and different with this pandemic, it's going to take some time for people to get used to it, to figure out how to do this efficiently and to make it, you know, a more routine part of, um, uh, of our lives. This is getting that way for nursing homes already where these kinds of regular testing strategies have been deployed in many nursing homes and they work uh, to prevent spread. It's getting that way already in colleges. Uh, Duke University has a, a regular testing protocol for our students and faculty along with the, the good distancing measures, you know, redesigning classrooms, and very importantly, a behavior compact, a Duke compact that everyone uh, um, uh, says they're going to adhere to. I wouldn't say it's perfect, but you know, this is really about changing culture too, uh, and it works. Uh, we've been successfully, you know, knock on wood, successful with reopening and, and staying open, and same thing is true for many other organizations that are starting to adopt these strategies and the tests are getting easier as well. But I would say that um, availability of tests is still an obstacle, a decreasing one, especially if we take steps like uh, planning ahead and have federal and state governments uh, making clear that we need to get to this testing capacity. We've done that for um, vaccines. We're doing it for other therapeutics where we're you know, committing to, to, to buying more products, even though we're not completely sure we're going to need them or completely sure they're going to work perfectly uh, a few months from now, because it's so worthwhile, a few billion dollars to help us get out of the pandemic um, seems like a, a, a very good investment. So this, um, you're right, we're not there yet in overcoming all of these obstacles, but these are important steps, I think, along the way. Thank you. So we have a question about public trust and testing. The question discusses the, the concern about billing and insurer practices and, and how they have the potential to undermine the whole system until home testing is available. What policies are needed to increase public trust in testing? Um, I'll take that one. I think that that is an absolute critical question. Um, public trust in general has not been there um, for a variety of reasons. I think that there were challenges at the beginning about the quality of testing, the availability of testing, and what to do with the results. Um, we, at, certainly at ASU, but through Rockefeller, believe that education of the general public and decision makers is critical to increase confidence in testing, number one. Number two is 
at the beginning of the pandemic, there were virtually no publications. It was clearly new. And the old method of three to six months to publish your results of a survey just was not working. And what has happened since then is that there's now a preprint service that was used sparsely before and now is very common to get the results of this testing out there. Thirdly, um, groups like the Rockefeller Foundation and other foundations are encouraging transparency, just like testing commons.com and the workplace commons, all of these are free and open. So I encourage you to go to the sites and learn for yourself and feel comfortable with it. While there's pros and cons to social media, I think the benefit of social media is when there is a critical mass of people asking questions about a particular technology or test, somebody is compelled to answer. And speaking, as, as you're coming up with the next question, Nate, I'll just share on the slide some of the links to what we've talked about today, and most importantly, the last one, what Mark discussed, the National Decision Point Report. You can read the press release, the executive summary, and you can get a sense of the importance of this and Rockefeller's commitment to transparency of information and data. Great. Um, I think uh, another question is, isn't it likely that a large company would be able to, to ramp up to significantly more than 50 million tests per month as the strategy takes root? And sort of along that lines is um, about rural populations in the communities and, and how, do we, how do we get tests to them? Well, two good questions. One is, it, it's hard to opine on this. Should it be more than 50 million tests a month? You know, each technology is different and having run manufacturing for one of these large companies, I can tell you directly, it's really hard and it takes, forget the money, it takes six to nine months to build a new facility if you have it, put the lines in, et cetera. So most of the increase in capacity has come from adding additional manufacturing lines. It's hard to say what is a big number. What I'm optimistic about is that it's not, it's no longer about two companies having a point of care antigen test. There are four companies today, and if I'm, I'm gonna bet on this, so you can all hold me accountable in a public forum, I bet we'll have double that number of companies have EUA approvals before the end of 2020 and increasing numbers from there. So I, I, even if they could do 100 million or 200 million a month, which they can't today, I don't wanna be betting on one company. I want a diversity of supply that makes me feel more comfortable. Um, what was the second question? It was about getting it to getting tests oh, rural to communities. rural communities yeah. or dis uh, disabled communities. The rural communities um, are something in particular in the Southwest, in the native lands and reservations. First, I'll say that in the Rockefeller Testing Solutions Group, it's 26 cities, I believe now, and that in, as well as several um, Native, Native American communities. Um, so that is something that we're consciously doing. Uh, I think home testing might be a huge help for those who are disabled and homebound. And I hope and expect that there will be some home testing available in Q4. It's not an ideal solution, but we have to band together to be creative to bring multiple uh, different solutions into different settings. Okay, well, we are at the end of our time. Thank you all for joining us and participating. And we look forward to seeing you at future COVID Diagnostics Commons webinars, which we are displaying here. Um, and we will put these on our website as well, asucovidcommons.com. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you. And if any of you have uh, additional questions, please go to COVID, asucovidcommons.com, submit your questions there, and one of us will be sure to get back to you within the next few days. Thank you.